Thank you very much, Juan. Thanks uh, to all of you for organizing this very nice event and for inviting me. I must say I'm bummed I don't get to go to Beijing. I have very good memories. I was a postdoc in Beijing quite some time ago, and I like to come visit, but maybe when the situation is better, we can do something in person too, I hope. Um, so, <laughs> yes. So, uh, what I want to tell you today is, uh, well, some... There is not that much new material here. There is things that I think are interesting and there is maybe a little bit which is new and interesting. So I want to talk to you about uh, 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 public key encryption as how, how you can break it if you, if you have access to a statistical zero knowledge oracle, whatever that is. So let me try to tell you why this might be interesting and what it really means. So, you know, you might be a cryptographer, maybe you don't do cryptography, but I, all of you know that there is many different ways of doing public key encryption. It's not so easy to get it, but uh, there are several constructions. And then cryptographer obsess about which one is better all the time, right? So how do they compare them? Well, I mean, there are obvious ways to compare them, which is you can compare how efficient uh, the encryption algorithm is, right? If I want such and such level of security, then uh, how, 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 which one does the encryption faster and which one, and, and you can say that, that, uh, that uh, encryption scheme is better. Or you can think about security, right? And that's another thing that people obsess about for some time now, whether you have quantum security or you can break it with a quantum algorithm, or even if you don't have a quantum algorithm, you have a classical algorithm, how much security you can get for a given key size and so on. And these are all valid ways to compare things. Uh, but today what I want to tell you about is sort of a more complexity-based approach of uh, evaluating how secure crypto systems are. And I think some of you, you know, are, are, do work in this area, so you know about it, but let me sort of try to give a little bit of overview about uh, how complexity theory uh, informs uh, the security of cryptographic construction. And here is, I try to summarize the whole history in one slide because it's not that important for this specific talk, but it's, uh, I want to just give you a sense of how people reason about these things. And this is something that even when the first crypto paper, well, when Diffie and Hellman came up with the idea of doing uh, public key exchange, they realized that what's important for being able to do cryptography is to have hard problems. And the hard problems are actually in the class NP. So they realized that if P equals NP that you can break uh, any, any, any kind of, pretty much any kind of crypto that, 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 that you can imagine. There are very few exceptions to that. And well, then the natural question to ask is what are the minimal complexity assumptions that we uh, need to make in order to be able to do cryptography? And ideally what we would want to have is we would want to be able to say that if P does not equal NP, then we can do, uh, then we can do cryptography. And the picture turns out to be at least in the years that came out after that and until now it turns out to be more complicated than that and sort of the view that emerged over the years is that there are different levels of cryptography that you might want to do so there is the p does not equal np assumptions which is somehow the minimal assumptions that you can make and right now we don't know if that buys us anything useful for doing crypto and there are various kinds of steps in the ladder that you need to go from there in order to get useful cryptography. So the first one, and a lot of the focus has been in uh, this one here, is that how do you get average case hardness out of NP hardness? And because this is the kind of hardness we need in order to do crypto, it's not that uh, uh, we need NP problems that are hard in the worst case, but we need them to be hard on average. Then how do you go from there to getting one-way functions or private key crypto? Then how do you go from there to getting public key crypto? And then you can go crazy and ask what about homomorphic and all these other kinds of stuff that people worry about today. So it's a simplified picture. There are a lot of kind of different branches here and it's not even a ladder. You can go in different directions, but, uh, but, but uh, it's not so important what these categories are. I just want to talk more about the methodology today. So now that we know, you know, people try to do to, to prove that uh, <laughs> to, to eliminate the barriers between these different uh, types of, uh, of, of computational hardness, they ask, well, maybe it's not possible. And what is the evidence that maybe these barriers do exist? And there, I think there are kind of two 
ways that you can argue that maybe it's not so easy to go from one to the other. The first one is oracle separations. And the most famous result of this kind, I think, and the most convincing one also is this uh, result by Impagliazzo and Rudich from 95 that focus on this barrier between one-way functions and public key encryptions. And the way that they argued that these two are fundamentally different is by saying that if you have access to a random oracle, so this is just some kind of random function that everybody can compute. It's not efficiently computable, but it just looks random to everyone. Then in this model, you do have one-way functions, but you can make sense of the statement that you don't have public key encryption. Uh, well, you have to you have to twist a little bit of logic, but uh, but but you can somehow argue that this gives you power to do one thing, but it doesn't give you power to do the next thing on the ladder. Um, and so this is one way to argue that that uh, there is indeed some kind of barrier that that needs to be overcome when you go from one stage to the other. Uh, and I'm not going to list. There is a lot of follow-up works that I don't even know all of them that extend this method and show all kinds of other barriers between different things. It's it's a business, right? If you see some place where there is no oracle separation, you can try to write a paper that proves one. Uh, the next one is uh, well, the way that we prove things in uh, in in complexity theory and cryptography is often we prove it by reduction, right? We say that if I want to uh, uh, say, show problem A is hard, I assume I can solve problem B, and then uh, uh, I use the, uh, uh, sorry, I, I assume that, uh, yeah, I can solve problem B, and I use that to solve problem A. And so what Feigenbaum and Portno did, they showed in some sense that there is a barrier at this stage for reductions. And then this has been extended in various ways, showing that if I try in some kind of natural, you can think way of showing that uh, I want to base uh, average case hardness of, on NP hardness, I run into some problems if I just want to do it using reductions. Uh, and I want to say that even though this is kind of established methodology, and again, a lot of work gets done this way, it was kind of, <laughs> there were some recent developments, and especially there is this, I think, amazing work by Hirahara, who showed that at least the second kind of barrier that we have, you can, you can get around it. Okay, so he showed that there is ways of the, of, of proving, uh, let's say that uh, algorithm for one thing gives you an algorithm for a different thing without uh, doing a black box reduction. So, so you make more assumptions about it. And again, it's not exactly uh, important what he uh, what he proved here, uh, but uh, the lesson that I want to draw from this is that these results should not be taken at face value, they should not be taken too seriously. And I think his, his uh, work actually gave some hope that maybe you can overcome these barriers. But in the years since he, he worked on it, actually it turned out that we still don't know how to use this kind of methods to get crypto based on NP hardness. You can get other things, but you cannot get any useful crypto out of it, at least not yet. <laughs> Uh, so that's that's kind of the state of uh, how people argue about the uh, complexity of cryptography, about how one thing is easy, wh whether one thing is easier or one thing is harder than another. Um, yes, I feel free to ask any questions, if, but I guess this is uh, maybe 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 you uh, it, it, familiar with it. So so, so we do okay. have uh, yes. we do yes. have hardness amplification of worst case to the average case at the we the have hardness case. amplification. That's true. Right, so different levels of hardness. If you, well, so there are two parameters when you talk about crypto. There is sort of the running time of the algorithm or the size of the adversary. And because your average case, there is also the probability of success or the advantage of the distinguisher. And the second thing we can amplify, right? But when we talk about computational hardness there, we don't know how to amplify that. So that, that's a so good point. So it means that the Existing hardness amplification cannot reduce the error to negligible functions. To zero, no, it can. It, we don't know how to reduce the error to, to zero, and there are various kind of explanations about why it fails. Again, none of which are completely convincing. Thank you. It's a, it's a very good question. Yes. Um, Yes, and I think part of the motivation of this why people studied it in the nineties is because you can do a lot of these reductions in the domain of one-way functions and to a lesser extent in public encryption. So for one-way functions there, you can show that a lot of things are equivalent to one another. 
weak one-way functions where the error uh, can be large, strong one-way functions where the error is negligible, pseudo-random generators, and so on. All these things are equivalent to one another. And they were like, well, these are really cool reductions, so why can't we go up and down the ladder? And then Impagliato and Rudy showed, you know, hold on, they don't actually work. These kinds of reductions don't, don't work to overcome this barrier. Um, so what I want to, to talk about today is uh, uh, sort of try to argue a little bit about why public key encryption might not be anti hard to break. So I want to focus, you know, I want to ignore this distinction over here and I want to focus on, on, on this barrier. And what I'm going to say, well, let me uh, uh, be, uh, come clean. It's, it's, there is not much new here. I'm not going to prove a new theorem. I'm going to focus more about on the methodology, about how I might want to argue that something is not NP-hard to break. We, know, we all know how to argue something is NP-hard, but how do I argue that something is not NP-hard? Uh, and I want to show you to support this by showing you some examples. So we're just going to do a few exercises to show how this works. And maybe at the end, I'm going to, if I have time, I'm going to tell you a non-example. I'm going to tell you about a problem in which I actually don't know. Uh, it's a public key encryption scheme that I don't know how to argue using this methodology that it's not anti hard to break. I don't know if it's true or false. It has some similarities. Well, anyway, let, let me leave it for the end. Uh, so let me start with an example to, to, to illustrate the methodology. So here is an NP claim. There exists an X such that X squared equals 3 mod 11. And how do you prove this claim? Someone give me a proof. You guys can design pseudo random generators, but here it's like an exercise. So, what is a proof? Um, five squared equals two. good, excellent. So, x equals five is a proof. So, this is a typical NP statement, right? So, to give you a proof, I just have to give you the value of x and everything else you can check efficient. No mystery there. Now I have another claim, which is that there does not exist an X such that X squared is 8 mod 11. So how do you prove this claim? Jakob is in bulk. Sorry? Jakob is in bulk. Uh, I, I cannot. Uh, 8 to uh, the power of 8 to 5 is uh, uh, negative 1. Okay, yeah, so there are various ways to do it using algebra, and that's, that's the trick, right? If you see this question, the first, like, you see it for the first time, you're like, well, you know, I have to check all possible values of x to convince myself that this isn't true. But actually, there is a shortcut. In fact, there are several shortcuts, but one shortcut is that it's a fact, actually, it's an algebraic fact that uh, y and minus y cannot both be squares. Okay, so if, uh, so in fact, the first proof x equals 5 is also a proof of the second fact, right? Because y equals minus 3 mod 11. And we know that 3 is a square, we know that uh, 8 cannot be a square mod 11. So in fact, x equals 5 is also a proof of the second fact. Um, so uh, it's a miracle that happens, but it's an interesting miracle. So, uh, so, uh, so what was the complexity picture here? And this is the picture, right? So we have P, we have NP, and we have core NP. And a lot of the time when we think about NP problems, we think in NP hardness, we are looking at things that fall somewhere in here. But here is a special case, like this is the quadratic residuosity problem, which falls somewhere inside NP and core NP. I can both prove to you that something is a quadratic residue, mod a suitable prime, and I can also prove to you that something is not a quadratic residue mod a suitable prime. But I don't know how to calculate it easily. So I don't have a polynomial time algorithm for determining whether it's the case. So it falls somewhere, somewhere in here. And so and this is going to be the way that one way of arguing that something is not NP hard is that it falls inside NP intersect for NP. Uh, so, you know, it's a complexity theorist kind of reasoning that we think that this cannot be NP hard because if they are, then NP and co NP collapse, and then uh, uh, then a lot of things that people have thought about very hard uh, also have this kind of refutations, which we don't believe to be the case. Uh, and actually, what it's a little bit hard to think about NP intersect co NP. It's possible, 
But I'm going to cheat a little bit and I'm going to say that, okay, I, I messed up the writing, but there is this very nice subclass, which is almost the same as NP intersect point P, which is called statistical zero knowledge. And it has very nice properties. Uh, so what is statistical zero knowledge? Like zero knowledge sounds like it comes from crypto, but it's actually a purely uh, complexity uh, theoretic uh, uh, class. And uh, so uh, this is the crypto definition of statistical zero knowledge is that it's an interactive proof system. So just like I give you proofs that something is a quadratic residue or not, I can also give you interactive proofs where a prover and verifier interact a bit and then you're convinced of the fact. And the property of this is that the verifier's view can be sampled without interaction or the way that people usually say it is that you're con after you've seen the proof, you're convinced that the fact is true, but you have no idea why it is true. And the reason you have no idea why it is true is because when you replay in your head what went on, you realize, well, I could have done this myself. And this is quite counterintuitive and I'm not going to try, well, I'm sure many of you know it, I'm not going to try to teach it here, but the very nice thing about statistical zero knowledge is you can think about it without uh, knowing the definition at all. And the reason is that there is a complete problem for the class, which is very nice. It's called the statistical distance problem. Uh, so this is kind of the problem that ca captures the whole class. And this is what the problem is. I give you two circuits and I think of these circuits as being sampler. So I feed them a random input and then uh, the output is some kind of distribution, right? And they're both distributions on n-bit strings. And I give you the circuits and you can look at them as much as you want. And you have to tell me one of two things. Do the distributions they produce, are they statistically close to one another or are they statistically far from one another? Uh, so it turns out that this captures statistical zero knowledge completely. So if I want to prove to you that something is hardcore statistical zero knowledge, I need to reduce, uh, it's enough for me to reduce from this problem. But actually the way that we're going to use it is the opposite. If I want to, it's, it's an unusual way to use reductions, but it actually is very nice here. If I want to prove to you that something is in statistical zero knowledge, it's enough for me to show you that I can reduce it to this problem. Namely that if I give you the power to calculate statistical distance, then you can solve uh, the problem at hand. And this is uh, how we are going to uh, argue why uh, uh, a, a, some candidate public key encryptions are easy is that they can be broken uh, using an oracle or an imaginary algorithm that, 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 that solves this problem. Okay, so it's something again that we don't believe is in P, we don't have polynomial time algorithm, but it's somewhere in NP intersect to NP rough. So again, let me redo the example that I just showed you, right? So uh, we said that uh, quadratic residuosity showing whether uh, there is something that, uh, whether something is a quadratic residue modulo a suitable prime is in NP intersect coin P, but in fact it is in statistical zero knowledge. So uh, here is, so in order to prove to you that, to show to you that something like this in statistical zero knowledge, I need to give you the samplers, right? I need to give you two samplers so that if X is a quadratic residue, then they produce distributions which are similar. And if X is, sorry, if Y is a quadratic residue, they produce distributions that are similar. And if it's not, they produce distributions that are far apart. And these are the distributions. So distribution A is just a random quadratic residue. I sample a random R and I square it. Distribution B is I sample a random R, I square it and I multiply it by Y. And now there are two cases, if X is a quadratic residue, like for example, uh, uh, sorry, if Y is a quadratic residue, if Y uh, equals three, for example, then this distribution three R squared is going to look exactly as five R squared, right? Because five squared equals three which is identically distributed to R squared. So then you get the two distributions to be identical, not only close, but they're identical to one another. On the other hand, if Y is not a quadratic residue, for example, Y equals eight, then what you get is that eight R squared is never going to be of the form R prime squared for, um, for, for some other R prime. They're going to, the two distributions are going to be completely disjoint because, right, because we know that eight itself cannot be written as like a ratio of two uh, group elements squared, which, which would be a quadratic residue. So 
so it's kind of it's it's magical right that i give you this problem that has nothing to do with it's just some kind of uh, strange reduction but you automatically get that a problem which looks very much like an np problem is also a uh, false inside co np just by just by knowing that these two distributions exist you, you magically get that not only do you have proofs for it but you also get refutations for it uh, so and that's the methodology that i want to illustrate here um, okay any any questions about what we're going to do well i didn't tell you exactly what we're going to do so let me tell you for the remaining time uh, so we are going to give, show some examples where we can break public encryption schemes using the ability to use a statistical zero knowledge oracle. So first of all, let me review what is public encryption. Uh, so uh, uh, there is a public key, right? This is uh, Alice wants to send a message to Bob. So first she sends a public key. Everybody can see it. She has some secret key, which is correlated to it, but nobody knows what it is. Then Bob sends an encryption of a message, which you can think is a bit, it's either zero or one. And then Alice can recover the message. That's the functionality part. And then there is the security part, which is that someone who observes this whole interaction, so Eve sees both the public key and the encryption of the message, uh, she tries to learn something about the message, not even get the whole message, but learn some information about the message. And the claim is that she cannot do it, uh, namely that, well, I didn't write it here, that uh, public key together with an encryption of zero, let's say, is computationally indistinguishable. As a distribution, it looks the same as a public key together with an encryption of one of the public key. So this is what the security of the scheme should satisfy. Uh, so, but in fact, what we're going to do here is we're going to use this SDK Oracle to break the security. So what we say is, right, we do believe that the schemes I'm going to show you are secure, that we have withstood attacks, but now I give you this extra power, I give you this statistical zero knowledge oracle, and now suddenly you can break a lot of them. So let me show you some examples. So the first example I want to show you is Elgamal encryption. And again, if you have seen this, it looks familiar. If you have not seen it, it's a little bit hard to get why it works in five minutes, but again, it doesn't matter to us why it works, what matters is the definition. So the way that LGAML encryption works is the, pop, the there is some generator G of some cyclic group. It doesn't exactly matter what it is. And then the public key is this G raised to the secret key. And it's something that we believe powering is easy, but going the other way from the public, from the public key to the generator is hard. And then to encrypt the message, what do I do? I send two pieces of information, G raised to some randomness R, and the public key raised to some randomness R multiplied by the message. And then if I can undo the operation, if I know the secret key, then I can kind of cancel out this part with this part eventually and uncover the message. So what I want to show you today is that this encryption is not secure if you have access to a statistical zero knowledge oracle. So what does it mean? It means that suppose you want to tell if something x, y is an encryption of one or is an encryption of two. So these are the two messages that I'm going to take, just to be specific. But it's, again, it's not super relevant. Uh, and the reason that you can break it using a statistical zero knowledge oracle is that you can do this attack. You can take this encryption of an unknown message, which is either a, a one or a two. So I take this pair x, y, and I raise both of them to some new random power r prime. And what does this look like? So it turns out it's going to look different for encryption of one, and it's going to look different from encryption of two. So again, so what uh, uh, this is going to look like is something like this, is that uh, the x part is g to the r. So here you get something like g to the r times r prime. And for the y part, you get something like m raised to the power r prime times uh, public key raised to the power r times r prime. And now we can see that if the message is a one message, then what this looks like is pretty much like a fresh encryption of one, right? Because I re-randomized the exponent here. Okay, so this is going to look like a fresh encryption of one, if the message happens to be a one. And if message happens to be a two, 
then I'm randomizing these two parts essentially with independent randomness. So this is going to look like, sorry, this is not what I meant. I meant the, the two parts are going to become independent of one another because uh, this message is something that I raised to some fresh randomness. So you get independent, you get a random pair. Let me call it x prime, y prime, if m equals to two. So, uh, and, and so essentially what, what, what this allows you to do is you take an existing encryption and you re-randomize it. You create a fresh encryption of it, which is independent of the one that you started with. So then if I have a statistical zero knowledge oracle, I can give it this encryption and I can create a new encryption of one. And I can say, are they from the same distribution or, 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 uh, do, or do these samplers that generate this encryption generate the same distribution or do they generate two very different distributions? So, and this is how the SDK Oracle allows you to distinguish encryptions which are re-randomizable. So this is uh, an example of a re-randomization. Okay. I think I went over it a little bit quickly, so uh, I hope it is sensible that if m equals one, you get one distribution, which looks exactly like, or almost exactly like a distribution of a fresh encryption of one. And if m equals two, you get some very different distribution because you raise the message to some power r prime. So, that, so then if I look at the circuit that takes this fresh randomness and creates the re-randomization, it's going to give me some distribution which is very different from the actual distribution of an encryption. And this was something that, uh, uh, so, so it turns out that you can take this and, and you can prove a theorem uh, which says that if you have any encryption scheme which is re-randomizable, uh, uh, then you can break it using a statistical zero knowledge oracle. And uh, I, I have an old paper with Chin Ho Lee from 2013 where we showed that this randomizable encryptions actually is a property that any homomorphic encryption scheme has. So if you have a homomorphic encryption, pretty much with respect to any operation with very few exceptions that we didn't know how to handle, uh, then uh, uh, the punchline is that this scheme cannot be too secure, cannot be anti hard to break because it, it is going to be. Uh, uh, vulnerable to a statistical zero knowledge oracle. Uh, so if you want to get, I mean, this is usually the thing you struggle with in crypto, the more functionality you want to get, uh, you have to compromise the security. There are not so many candidates that work. So maybe there are not so many assumptions you can make. And what he says, if you want to get a very high level of functionality, namely homomorphism, uh, then you have to give up the dream of basing encryption of NP hardness. So that's that's one example. Uh, the second example I want to show you is regif encryption. And again, I'm not going to explain to you how regif encryption works. And the reason I want to show you is because here, actually you can break it in different ways, but one way that you can break it is by, unlike the first one, where essentially the way that we broke the encryption using the Oracle is by distinguishing two encryptions. What the way that you can break the regif encryption is by saying whether a public key is a real public key or it's a fake public key. And what do I mean a uh, real public key and a fake public key? So I have to explain what a public key in regif encryption looks like. I don't have to explain the encryption scheme itself. So a public key in regif encryption looks like this. There is some matrix A in like ZQ, uh, I don't know, n by k or something like this. So it has some random entries, which are uh, random elements modulo some number q, which is moderate. It's not two, but it's not, it doesn't have to be too large. It's moderately large. And so you get this matrix of random entries, but then you also get a vector b, which is correlated to this matrix. And the way that it's correlated is that you get it by multiplying this matrix a by another random vector, which is the secret key. And then you have to add a little bit of noise to it. If you don't add the noise, then you know you the you, you can figure out the relationship between A and B using linear algebra. 
And what the assumption behind RIGF encryption is, is that this uh, distribution of A and B, the joint distribution of A and B, cannot be distinguished from something which is completely random. Meaning that, again, I take a random matrix A, which is the same as before, but now B is a vector which is random and completely independent of the matrix A. And he used this to build the public key encryption. I mean, most of what he did is justify this assumption. You can do some very clever reductions to show that this is actually worst case hard to break based on some lattice problems. But again, what's, what's important for us is that uh, <clears throat> whatever his encryption scheme does, is it relies on the, on, on the indistinguishability between these two distributions, computational indistinguishability between these two distributions. And what I want to show you again is one way to break this computational indistinguishability if you have access to a statistical zero-knowledge oracle. So again, what I need to do is I need to be able to tell whether I'm looking at a real public key or I'm looking at a fake public key, namely some matrix which is completely random, even the last column is random, uh, given the ability to distinguish two samplers. So the, these are not difficult reductions, but the conceptual uh, point here is that when you try to break an encryption scheme, you're given a single sample. I'm given something that either looks like a public key or looks like a random matrix. And what statistical zero knowledge allows me to do is I can distinguish distributions produced by two samplers. So samplers are circuits. So what you need to do is somehow take a single sample and turn it into a sampler, turn it into something that produces a whole distribution based on one sample. Uh, and this is, there is a clever way to do it. This is a protocol of Gold, Goldreich and Goldwasser, which was discovered in, in 96. And the picture looks something like this. Okay, so you have to visualize what these two distributions look like. And the way that you visualize it is that you look at the span of the matrix A and the span of the matrix A plus the vector B, which in this case, span of A plus B is the same as the span of A plus noise, right? Because the vector B is some linear combination of the columns of A plus noise. So this is what happens for the real public key. And if you look at the fake public key or the model distribution, then B is a completely random vector. So then what span A plus B is going to look like is going to look like span A plus a completely random vector. And if you try to kind of picture what this looks like geometrically, in mm -hmm. one case, the span of A and the span of A plus noise are going to be very close to one another as hyperplanes, as some kind of discrete hyperplanes in, in modular arithmetic. And when uh, B is a random vector, then these two are going to be far apart from one another. And what the protocol of Goldreich and Goldwasser does, or the way that you sample the two distributions is now like this. What the sampler is going to do, is going to take a point uh, that comes either from the top one or from the bottom one, and then it's going to add some noise to it, okay? So it's going to add a random noise vector to it. And in the top case, because these two are very close to one another, once I add some extra noise to it, so this is some extra noise. So this is like a random point that comes either from here or here, and then you add a bunch of extra noise to it. You can kind of visualize that the two distributions are now going to be very close to one another, right? Because if I take two planes which are very close and then I add a bunch of noise, then I don't know where the outcome came from, whether it came from the top one or from the bottom one. Well, if I look at the second uh, scenario where, so this is the real public key and this is like the fake public key or the model distribution. Then what's going to happen is that when I take a sample and I add some noise to it, because these two are very far from one another, you can tell whether the point came from here or it came from here. Because you no, know, you can kind of think about there is some region of space which makes it much more likely that the points came from the top plane and there is some region of space that makes it very likely that the points came from the bottom one. And yeah, you have to set the parameters and everything, but this is the this, this is essentially the idea of the of the of the of the statistical zero knowledge proof. So if you think about it as a sampler, what the sampler allows you to do is you take this particular sample and then you re-randomize it in some way again. You take some random combination, you add a bit of noise, 
in one case, you get two distributions which are very close to one another. In the other case, you get two distributions which are far apart from one another. So that's another trick that you can play in this. In this. Uh, sorry, can you give us some um, uh, idea what kind of uh, noise distribution is this? Uh, because uh, okay, yeah, good distribution. question. Uh, yeah. So, so usually you think of, uh, so first I have to give you a sense of the parameter. So you can think of Q as being some polynomial in N, like let's say N to the 10 if you want to take. And you can think of a noise as being, okay, let me say it oversimplifies a bit, but let's say it's like uniform on the range between, I don't know, uh, minus N to N. Uh, I think, okay. okay. So it's much smaller than the signal, right? So you can yeah, think right. of these two as being much closer to one another than this. So if I add enough extra noise, it's enough to confuse sort of what goes on in this extra direction, but here I cannot, right? I can always get that. And I mean, that's part of the power of this, uh, what is based crypto is that you have a lot of flexibility in how you can pick these parameters and you can make things to work. And in fact, you can try to optimize it. So you can pick Q to be a smaller square root of N and it still works. So this is part of the work that, uh, that, 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 that okay, extra thanks. work that is done, yes. Thanks, it's a very good question. Um, okay, uh, so the next one I want to show you, this is uh, the part that's, that's, that's slightly new, is uh, this new assumption, which is called continuous learning with errors. But I think it's a bad name because it really doesn't have that much, at least on the surface, to do with learning with errors, with, which is the, uh, uh, the kind of assumption that we just saw now. And this, this, this is an assumption, an indistinguishability assumption for two distributions that are distributions of vectors of real numbers. So it's actually very nice. So these are what the two distributions look like. Uh, this is the distribution, this is one of the distribution, distribution A, let me call it, which is, I have a vector of real numbers, x1 to xn, and the way that I sample it is that I sample each coordinate as an independent Gaussian, standard normal, except for the last one, in which case I sample it as a uh, kind of a discrete normal, not a continuous normal, but a discrete normal, so that I, it is periodic in the last direction, in direction xn. It's a little bit thick. It's not exactly discrete for, for some not so relevant reason. Uh, but so you have something where in all directions, it looks like a normal distribution. And in the last direction, it looks like something different. And what their assumption says is that this looks completely random. So if I sample a standard normal Gaussian, something that's Gaussian in all directions, then you cannot tell these two distributions apart. Well, clearly you can tell them apart. If I just look at xn, one of them will have a discrete structure, the other one will have a continuous structure. But what they actually say is that now if I randomly rotate the vector, so I don't look at x1, xn like this, but I apply a random rotation in space, then these two distributions become uh, indistinguishable from one another. And actually this is a case where a picture is really one uh, a thousand words. So let me show you a picture of this. So here is a distribution in three dimension. Here I have x1, x2, and x3. I sample it like this and I randomly rotated it. And you can see it looks like a big blob. It looks like if you have seen multidimensional Gaussians, this is what they look like, right? And now you start playing with it. Let me and see that if you, uh, usually, uh, here, you can start seeing. See, you can see the structure. This is now we found the direction in which you have the discrete structure. And so the assumption, well, in three dimensions, you can do it by playing on the computer. And what their assumption says is that if I do this in n dimension, then it become, becomes exponentially hard in n to find this direction in which this pancake structure emerges. So what this discrete structure does is it, it kind of plants these pancakes in, in, in the hidden direction. And so what does this have to do public, with public encryption? Well, it turns out that you can design a public encryption based on this assumption. And it turns out that even though this is a paper that was written in 2021, 
the public key encryption itself was designed in 1997, except that they didn't know this is what they were doing. But this is the ITAID work encryption scheme. So I will show you, I will not show you how that works. It's a little bit complicated. What I will show you is a simplification that we came up with, which is not as good for crypto purposes, but it's going to be much better for teaching, for showing you how it works. And this is in joint work with Miguel Cueto Noval and Charlotte Hoffman and Alon Rosen. So how, what does this distribution look like? So the public key here is going to consist of a bunch of samples from this distribution. So I take M n-dimensional samples of, of this HCLWE distribution with some hidden direction. And the secret key is going to be the direction in which these samples are hidden. So it's the direction of this uh, um, uh, discrete, uh, uh, discrete uh, where, the, where the distribution is discrete. Uh, and I'm just going to make it very simple. I'll show you how to encrypt the zero and how to encrypt the one. And the way that you encrypt the zero is you think of this public key as being a matrix now, consisting of all these samples. And I'm just going to multiply this matrix by a plus minus one vector, okay? And then I'll do some rounding, but let's not worry about what this rounding does now. You can think of it as I get a bunch of these samples and I multiply them by something which is either plus one or minus one. So I take some kind of <coughs> random, random linear combination of these samples over the reals. What I do to encrypt the one, I just uh, output a random Gaussian, okay? So here things are Gaussian, they're not bits. So I'm just going to output a random Gaussian, a random normal in uh, n-dimensional space, uh, which is scaled so that it has the same uh, mean and variance as the other ones. Uh, so why does decryption work first? I'll talk about security later. <clears throat> the reason that decryption works is that now if I take the secret key, which has this hidden direction, and I multiply it by an encryption of zero, which looks roughly, if I disregard the rounding, as the public key, uh, some plus minus one combination of the public key, the secret key and the public key itself, when I multiply them, they give me the hidden direction. So secret key times public key gives me the hidden direction. And then I get just some kind of plus minus one combination of these values which are close to being discrete. You can think of them as close to being multiples of one. Right? So I get something which is close to an integer. Well, if I take an encryption of one, which just looks like some, something completely random that doesn't have a discrete structure, then I get some random vector. When I do this product, I get some random vector, which and then I get a plus minus one combination. And there is no reason to believe that this is going to land anywhere near an integer. So this is going to be, with high probability, something which is far from, uh, from being integral. So then by figuring out whether the output is close to an integer or far, far from an integer, I can decrypt. And again, I think it's much better to show this by picture than to explain it in words. Uh, so here are two distributions. Now it's in two dimensions. And one of them is random, random Gaussian samples. And the other one is an HCLWA distribution. So there, there is some kind of hidden structure in periodic structure in one direction. Anyone willing to guess which is which? Uh. <laughs> no takers. <laughs> they look very much alike, right? Okay, yeah. so it turns out that the first one is the public key. This has the discrete structure and the second one is normal. And the way to see this is that now what happens when I start taking plus minus one combinations of these samples? So here are a bunch of random plus minus one combinations of the samples. And now you see it, right? In, in the first case, what you get is something that where this plus minus one structure really shows up in, in and, and you can see what the hidden direction is, right? So this is the hidden direction in which the plus minus one structure shows up. And in the second case, you get something that very much looks like a random Gaussian, okay? And in fact, it turns out that this is the main reason why you do get security is because if you look at this distribution here, and now I split up space into cells which have roughly the same Gaussian measure. So now I'm going to split up all of space. Well, the ones near the middle should be kind of bigger, right? The ones should be smaller, right? I split, I split it up into cells that have Gaussian measure. Then it turns out that you're going to roughly get the same number of samples inside each cell in the second distribution. And that's the main claim about security. And what this says is that, uh, right, again, if I take a plus minus one combination, 
And then I round it, and rounding it is exactly going to do this. It's going to take a point and map it to the closest cell that it's in. Then I get some distribution which is very close to what would have happened if I just took a Gaussian and rounded it. Right? So this is what the rounding looks like. If in each direction, I split, I, 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 I take a sample and then I map it to, uh, to whatever, whatever cell, right? I, I, let me give them names, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and so on. So I map it to whatever cell uh, it falls uh, under so that all of them have the same Gaussian measure. And so, and, and this is why the encryption happens to be secure is because these two distributions sort of, I can decorrelate the encryption from the key and it is statistically indistinguishable. If I use a completely random normal matrix instead of a public key, if I use a fake public key instead of the real public key. And then because of the computational assumption, I can replace the fake public key with the real public key and then I get the security of the encryption. I'm running a bit short of time, so I will skip over this. Again, the picture is much more important than the technical claim here. But what I want to show you now is that as a byproduct of this, so again, the question that I ask is which encryption can I break with the statistical zero knowledge oracle? And what this allows me to do is I design an encryption scheme. And now I can break this, this, this encryption scheme using a statistical zero knowledge oracle, or at least I can use it to distinguish the public key from a model matrix, which consists just of random Gaussians. And again, you can do it in two ways. I can give you a reduction to two distributions, or in this case, I'm actually going to show you what the statistical zero knowledge protocol looks like. So this gives me a way to interactively prove to you that something is either a public key matrix or a random matrix. It's an average case problem, so it's a distributional problem. Either I give you something that looks like a public key matrix with a hidden direction or a purely normal matrix, and you can distinguish between the two using a statistical zero knowledge oracle. And here is what how you do it in using a prover verifier system. The verifier is just going to send an encryption of a random bit, and the prover is going to decrypt it, right? The prover is powerful, he knows the secret key, so he's going to decrypt it. And the verifier, based on whether the prover could decrypt or not, knows uh, whether he's looking at the public key, uh, at the real public key or a, a fake public key. If it's a real public key, then the prover can certainly decrypt. Uh, and what the verifier gets to see is the decryption of the message that he encrypted. If the input is a fake public key, something that's completely random, then you're in this case where the two distributions, the encryption of zero and encryption of one look statistically indistinguishable. So then the prover cannot guess whether the verifier message was a zero or a one. And uh, so you get soundness, the verifier will know which one, which, which, which one happened. And I mean, this is kind of the canonical zero knowledge protocol where clearly the verifier didn't learn anything. I encrypted a bit and then I ask you to decrypt the same bit. So I learned whatever I encrypted. There is no, no, no extra information that I gained from this interaction. So I'm running a bit short of time. I don't want to go over. And I just want to give you a little bit more context uh, uh, before I end. And what I, why I think this question is interesting. So this goes beyond the inspiration of sort of figure out, figuring out which public encryption scheme you can, be, you can break using a statistical zero knowledge oracle is that this, HCLWE problem kind of looks a little bit different from the problem that people usually use to build public key encryption. Sort of one difference I think is that usually when you think about problems that are hard for crypto, they have discrete, they, they're discrete problems. But here it's kind of continuous, right? You get samples in, in space. And in fact, uh, the reason that uh, uh, um, this HCLWE problem was introduced and this, uh, uh, paper was written was not because of crypto, but it was because of um, a problem in machine learning called learning Gaussian mixtures. So what is the problem of learning Gaussian mixtures? Is that you get a bunch of samples that come from um, uh, some Gaussians which are centered at different points in space. And then the learning problem is to, to, to figure out what the centers are just based on the samples. Okay, so this has been studied a lot and people still study it in, in, um, 
both from theory and from other perspectives. And the theoretical results on this problem is that, in a few words, it's easy to do it when there are few mixtures. Uh, so when the number of centers is small, I can I can I can I can find them. Uh, though the algorithm is a bit complicated, but but it's possible to do it. But the dependence on the number of centers is exponential. So the more centers I introduce, like if I introduce a new one, then the hardness of the problem, at least for non-algorithm, doubles. Okay. And then what you want to do is, well, I want to find some explanation. Why is this problem hard in high, with, with many centers when I introduce many centers? And in fact, uh, this uh, HCLWU assumption is an attempt to explain why it's hard. Because you looked at the picture I showed you. It's exactly a bunch of distributions of this kind, but they're a little bit lopsided, right? There are these pancakes, which are Gaussians with, that are very thin in one direction. And this is an example of a distribution which is, in fact, uh, algorithmically hard if you accept that this assumption is true. And there is some evidence that this assumption is true. So I, what I think is kind of interesting here is that they have this hard instance, and we know it's hard for algorithms, but if I give you statistical zero knowledge, then you can break it. So here is a question that I'm interested in that I am not, have not been able to say much about. If I give you a statistical zero knowledge oracle, can you use it to learn Gaussian mixtures? Or maybe that's too ambitious to learn Gaussian mixtures, but can you learn other classes of Gaussian mixtures that we don't know how to, how to learn efficiently in another way? And in general, you can ask this question about many distributional problems, people that, that, that you come up with that are inspired from machine learning or statistical inference or whatnot, is that a lot of the time there, what you have is you have two distributions, right? One uh, distribution that is real samples come from and some model distribution, and you want to try to distinguish them. And there are some regimes for parameters at which in people think it's hard to do it, even though it's statistically possible, it's computationally hard. And the question is, if I give you more power, maybe I, if I give you NP, then you can do anything. But if I don't give you NP, I just give you something which is NP intersect po NP, or I give you a statistical zero knowledge oracle, does this help uh, solve uh, this kind of statistical inference problem? And I don't know, but I think it's a very good opportunity to use complexity theory in order to somehow enlighten people on how hard these uh, uh, average case problems are. Right. We're used to doing this in the worst case setting, but I think there is potential applications where we can try to use the same methodology to see whether problems are relatively easy or relatively hard in the average case setting. So let me actually I'm not I never have time to do the last example. I don't have anything terribly interesting to say about it, but you can ask me if you want. So let me just conclude. So the conclusion is inconclusive. Can crypto be based on NP hardness? I would say we know less about it now that we knew 10 or 20 years ago, in the sense that there is no plausible construction on one hand. We cannot say, here is a potential scheme. We think it works. We don't know how to prove it. We don't have anything like that. And we don't even have anything on the other side, right? We cannot say, well, it doesn't work because of this. And here I try to do something which is very not ambitious. Let's say I want to get public key encryption, not even private key. We cannot even rule it out. There are examples in which we can rule it out, but there are examples in which we cannot rule it out even in this setting. So that's 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 the first challenge. And I think part of what would uh, help is to have more examples. We haven't had a genuinely new example of a public key encryption in a long time. So trying to construct new examples and trying to test them might be a good way to develop intuition. Where do we find new examples? And I'm hoping, so HCLW is one such instance, though it's kind of related to LW, which is something people already looked at in crypto, but generally looking at these kind of problems where you get samples from some distribution over the reals and try to figure out, uh, try to learn this distribution is something that there are now a lot of examples in statistical inference and machine learning. And I think it's a very intriguing question whether we can take these uh, examples they give examples of one-way functions, so they, in principle, allow us to do public key, private key crypto. Can we take uh, such things and construct some genuinely new public key encryption out of them? Something that I have been trying to do with my uh, 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 collaborators. Uh, we haven't been very successful, except in this one case. But it's, uh, I think there is a lot of opportunity there as well. So let me end on this note. 
Thank you again, Juan. Thank you, uh, organizers and all the attendees.